Hey guys, this is Megan. I just wanted to give a heartfelt thank you to all the listeners. For the past two months, we already have over 5,000 listeners, which is incredible. I really want to keep this podcast going next year in 2020 to bring you real, raw conversations. The best way to do this is to check out patreon.com forward slash six feet above and become a patron to keep the conversation going. Oh man, how are you? Uh, how are you feeling about this? Honestly? Good. I'm Good. ready. Just I kind of just want to fucking get it over with. <laughs> honestly, like, yeah, because it's gonna be a lot for me because I was very close to his dad too. So, yeah. and then obviously hearing about how difficult like, yeah, I was to be around, and we talked more about like some stuff that I'd kind of forgotten about. Yeah. Um, which it's hard to hear. Um. It's hard to hear stuff about yourself that you thought you've kind of like dealt with and then someone brings up something and you're like, oh yeah, I did that. Or oh yeah, yeah I was that. Or, yeah. you know. Because um, you want to be, you kind of want to close that chapter. I want to close it, but I know like it will never be closed because it's very much a part of who I am and I will always have to deal with mental health and that's, it is what it is. Um, I think this is a good step in, in moving forward though, for sure. No, I think so too. And it's definitely... It's one of those things where everything's coming full circle because he's literally the guy that was like, you need to tell your story, you need to put it out yeah. there. Yeah. And to have someone that saw me at my worst now see me at my best so far um, and have that person tell me, like, encourage me to do this is yeah. huge. And, and you know, it's not just coming from some random person that knows me now. This is coming from someone that literally was with me, was loving me was trying to make things work when I was breaking into his apartment when I was physical with him when I was drinking too much when I was not dealing with all the things right. um so yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of like the, <sighs> it's gonna be right emotional is, yeah the last episode of 2019 is a little bit unconventional in this episode I interview the guy who inspired me to share my story he is in Hawaii and I'm here in Atlanta this is Dan's story. Enjoy. So this is the first interview I've been nervous about. And you're like the person I should least be nervous about or around, but I am. So um, this is a very special episode for the Six Feet Above podcast. Um, if you haven't listened to the very first episode of this series, which is my story, it's only 15 minutes long and it's just me explaining why I'm doing this and some of the things I've gone through in my life um, during a very trying 16, 17 years, um, a big chunk of it. And then also the person who was with me during a portion of that as my boyfriend in, in college. And then also um, the same ex-boyfriend was the person that encouraged me to share my story after his father took his own life last year. Um, I have the great pleasure to interview him, and he is coming to us all the way from Kona, Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, where he is a high school phys ed teacher. That's correct. Um, <laughs> so I just want to put that out there, that this is obviously halfway a third of the way across the world and um, it might be a little bit bubbly with the sound and the quality, but the content and the um, real raw shit is there and that's what matters. And I think that's what people keep tuning in for. So I'm forever grateful that you are talking to me and um, we've had a lot of conversations over the past year about this. So I just want you to see it as another one of those conversations. And it's just you and me on the phone. And um, we're two best friends from sixth grade that happened to date once upon a time. But um, I explained that you're my best friend more than anything. So this is Dan Curran. Hi. How's it going? Good. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to be on your podcast. It's pretty cool what you're doing. And um I support you, and I, I, you know, really stoked that you're you're taking that leap of faith and that you're doing something like this. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and I don't think I would have done it. It's one thing to have people see me now that didn't know me back then, 
but to have someone see the awful periods of my life that I went through um, and now see what I'm doing and how I've changed, to have that person say, you really should share your story is kind of what pushed me to actually do it. Um, so for that, thank you. And, you know, um, it took me a while. It's been a year that I've kind yeah. of been talking about this, but um, all good things, you know, in time and with patience and you, nothing is forced or can't be forced, especially when it comes to sensitive material like this. So let's just, so you teach um, phys ed to what, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th graders? Right. Yeah. So um, mostly ninth graders. Um, I do, I do work with some uh, upperclassmen. I used to teach a weight training class. Um, I don't teach that anymore. And right now it's, yeah, it's basically just uh, freshman high school PE. Uh, I've been at the same school over here for about 10 years. Okay. Uh, it's on the, the big island of Hawaii. Um, that's the, the last island on the chain of the islands. It's yeah, what's the, the, big the youngest island name. What is that? <clears throat> it's actually the island of Hawaii. Oh, so okay. that's that is the name of it, but people refer to it as Big Island. And I live on the west side in Kona. Um, that's the dry side, the hot side. And yeah. That's also where isn't that where the volcano was like a year or two ago? Or is, but that's where the the eruption was right. yeah the the flow and all that was was on this island and um, you you were there like right out of college and then you moved home for a little while and then you moved back right no so um i was a late bloomer well i wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna tell everyone that but <laughs> you don't need you to say did. it i'll say it it's okay i was a late bloomer um i didn't take the the traditional route um i did some experimenting and um, I actually didn't move out here until I was about 26 or 27, which back then, I, you know, I felt a lot of pressure to just have a job fresh out of college. Right. And I thought I was just screwing up right. because I didn't. Um, looking back on it, I'm like, oh, so I was doing OK. Yeah. You know, that wasn't too bad. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I came out here when I was 26 or 27 and um, I was here for a year. Um, and then I moved back to New York for a year because I wasn't sure about my job situation over here at the school. It's kind mm -hmm. of a long story. Uh, but then I ended up back here okay. and this is kind of where I wanted to be. And when I was back in New York, I, you know, for that year, it was just kind of miserable. I wasn't really happy. Yeah. So I was, I was glad to be back out here. And just to give everyone a little bit of a quick background, um, mm -hmm. I went to Catholic school growing up, and then in sixth grade, my parents moved me to the public school, which is where I met Dan. <clears throat> and then in like eighth grade, <laughs> in eighth grade, he sat behind me in homeroom, and he was my very first boyfriend ever. I forget who our teacher's name was, but I remember he bought me the um, for my birthday. You bought me the Presidents of the United States CD. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. What a classic. Yes. Something about eating peaches or millions of peaches or something. Yeah. And here I am in the peach yeah. state. So we, we go way back. Um, and ever since eighth grade, we were best friends. And then we dated for a few years in college and then broke up. We'll get into all of that. But did you even like that band? I'm not sure no, why I even did. chose that. I oh, did. you did. Okay. Yeah, so there's yeah. some context behind buying the CD. It yeah, wasn't like, just like a random you, choice. You paid attention. Like if there's one and there's a lot of good things I could say about you. But like one thing is you, you did pay attention, like even in eighth grade, you knew what I liked and you knew what made me happy. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, nothing ever extravagant happened between us in eighth grade, but we created a friendship. And from right. there, you know, you dated <clears throat> several of my friends throughout high school. We won't get into that. <laughs> and Likewise. vice versa but you know that's yeah. how it goes in a small town so we're from the same very very small town um and i wouldn't have it any other way um so you moved back to hawaii and then at one point you taught health i yeah so i uh the first year out here i taught health for half a semester um i 
I had never studied health uh, in college. I had I had other <laughs> means to learning the information, but I didn't I didn't actually take uh, any health. I mean, I took health courses obviously as a PE major, but not to teach right. health as a class. Right. So yeah, I taught it for a semester. It was my first year teaching. That was quite an experience. Um, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all that good stuff. Um, it was. It was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good experience for me because it got me out of my comfort zone right. for sure. Right. And um, also it was an opportunity for me to talk about some things that I think are very, very important when it comes to a high school education. Um, there's so many things that you, can, that you can put into that category, but your, your mental, emotional, and physical health is, right. to me, it's, it's at the top of the list. And that's definitely one of the big um, subjects that we're going to go over in this episode as well. Um, and not only that, but you know, you're a lacrosse coach as well, and you actually brought lacrosse to the school, right? They have never, yeah, they never had yeah. a team or even played it or picked up no. the sticks. Yeah, no. Actually, um, really, really cool piece of information is five years ago when I made the decision to start a lacrosse team, um, there was another school on the same island, a private school, that decided to do the same thing at the same time. Uh-huh. And to my knowledge, and I haven't heard different from, from anybody, um, we played the very first lacrosse game ever in the history of this island. Now really? they play it on they play it on Oahu and they've been playing it over there for a while, but when it comes to the big island, we played the very first lacrosse game in the history of this island about five years ago. So, so you starting a team there actually gave the other school a team to play against. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 So it was um you know, it was one of those gut decisions. It was just like it felt right to me it it felt like it was something that I needed to do um you know I don't want to get all like uh heady uh, ahead of myself or heady yeah right. and say like it was a calling but no it just felt right yeah. I think it you know in my in my heart in my gut it felt right well, and you so, come from an athletic background you played lacrosse in college and high school and before that and <clears throat> Right. And I had, you know, it was one of those things like the game has given me so much. So it was an opportunity for me to give back. Right. And um, I had a lot of influential coaches in my life that really helped shape the person that I am today. So yeah. I want to, you know, I want to be able to carry on that, that legacy of, of coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's where you're at now. Now let's go way back, way back to... Um, you know, growing up in a small town, your parents divorced when you were very young. I think I was nine years old when they when they um, split. Uh, Twelve years old when my dad got remarried, um, and that was kind of the you know the start of a new life for me. I I was an only child, so up until nine years old, you know, it was just the three of us. Right. And after that, I inherited a, uh, a wonderful blended family. Um, and, you know, we, we've known each other now. I think my sister Molly was four, five years old or something like yeah. that when my, when my dad got remarried. Um, so she's 31 now. So she's been, you know, she's been a huge part of my life along with my other siblings, but yeah. So you have two sisters and a brother. Two sisters and one brother, yep. And you're the oldest. I'm the oldest, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was the one that had to blaze the trail. (laughs) You you definitely blazed a trail. I blazed it, That's for sure. Um, Do you remember, like, were you upset when your parents got divorced? Were you upset when your dad got remarried, or was it all... Like, did you ever talk about it with your parents or was it just kind of like, here's what's happening, here's what's going on? Yeah, there's definitely that um, that tribal kind of mentality, you know, like this is this is my tribe and you're splitting it up and right. like, what what are you doing? Right. You know, this is bullshit. And you, you have some, uh, 
uh, some resistance initially, and and I you know I think my my siblings felt the same way mm-hmm. um, because we both had a pretty solid relationship with the other side of of our parents, you right. know, with their dad and me with my mom. Right. Um, so yeah, it was tough. You know, it, divorce sucks. You get put in the middle of a lot of shit and um, you go back and forth and, you know, uh, you, you, you're battling these questions in your mind that as a nine-year-old, you're too young to even understand, right. you know, or at right. any, any young age, really. Um, and you start playing the blame game or, or you know, you, you just kind of get in your head and it can, uh, it can, it can be exhausting. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, relatively speaking, uh, it was, uh, we were blessed and, and we had all the, the necessities and we were loved for and cared for. And it was by most circumstances, a pretty normal childhood. Right. You know? Right. And I'd say, you know, just, and obviously this is just an outsider looking in, but I think your dad was really happy with um, his wife and the fact that it was a blended family and he really took pride in that. Um, he really, you know, he loved your stepmom's kids as if they were his own and, oh, yeah. and vice versa. Um, and the legacy that he's left with them and you, obviously, um, just goes to show how much he cared about them. Yeah, he was well, he was one hundred percent a a family man. I mean, providing and and taking care of and um, showing up to games and all of those things were important to yeah. him. They they mattered, and the the familial vibe was something that was uh, very important to him. So sitting down and having dinners together or making sure that, you know, you were in the house over the holidays, all that kind of stuff was was important to him. And it was important to my, you know, um, my stepmom, Karen. And um, we were lucky that way. We were fortunate to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so last year on... I believe it was November 10th, November 9th, Dan? Yeah, November 9th. November 9th, um, your dad took his own life. And I don't ever use the term committed suicide because you commit a crime, you commit adultery. Like that's not, it's not any of those. It is just Mm -hmm. to the point where someone has chosen to leave the world because um, they don't want to be here. They can't handle it. And I remember the day that I got the news, it was the next morning. And uh, I mean, absolutely floored. Like I've known your dad as long as I've known you. And, um, Mm -hmm. you're the first person that has talked to me on this platform openly about that. And that has experienced Mm -hmm. it firsthand. And so thank you for that. A, um, and And B, it's only been a year. I mean, everything's got to be so fresh and and so raw and so real. And I don't think any amount of time really makes any pain go away. I think it's always going to be there. Um, Mm -hmm. But the, the more time, the more distance from when it actually happened. Um, so if you're comfortable just talking us through where you were when you found out and kind of what your initial reactions were. Prior to um, my dad taking his own life, there were, you know, um, there were maybe some, some warning signs or some some indicators that he was struggling with depression um, and he was always, you know, he was that guy. He was the guy that always came out on the other end of things or, you know, I'm going to be okay. Right. You know, if uh, you want to use the term a man's man or something, you know, I think that kind of falls into the category of toxic masculinity these right. days as people are like waking up to stuff like that. But um, he was that kind of person, 
so you i i remember like having concern and having some worry but like that was my guy right that was my hero like he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna go out like that right you know like that that was not the script that that i saw writing itself for him right um but he so, would come out here in the winter months. Uh, he would come out to Hawaii. He would get some sunshine. Mm -hmm. You know, where we grew up in the winter months, it can be really dark. It yeah. can be gray. That can have such an effect on your your mental yep. uh, mood, your, your emotional mood. Um, the physical needs, you know, getting out and exercising, it's tough if right. you, you can't leave the house. Um, so he would come out here. He would... Get his dose of sunshine. He'd get his dose of me. We were best friends. You know, we we had a ball together. Yeah. We laughed. We 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 just had a great time together all the time. People were like, "You guys are best friends." I'm yeah. like, "Yeah, it's it's almost like the best possible scenario you could have." You know, because I still respected him uh, immensely. Right. But we we could you know we've had some wild times together as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But, you know, it kind of got <clears throat> closer to the day of getting that phone call. It just got a little, the phone calls became less. The The interactions became less, few and far between. The, um, the last time I was home, um, he got sick, he got pneumonia, and he just wasn't himself. And I didn't know if that was because he was physically sick mm -hmm. or if it was that on top of his depression and, and everything else. So did you know I just kept when, the knot. <clears throat> when, when you were home that summer, did you know that he was depressed? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I did. I, yeah. I knew he was, he was going through depression. Uh, we had had conversations openly about it. You okay. know, he, he would say, I'm depressed, he, you know, um, but... As somebody that's gone through not depression, but you know some some mental health stuff like having anxiety, right. I know that you can't approach that by just saying like, "Ah, come on, you'll be all right." You know, right. just shake it off. It's right. okay. Um, so I was asking him questions like, "Are you taking medication? Are you talking to anybody?" You know, he didn't want to take the medication. It made him feel weird. Mm -hmm. He didn't like the way it made him feel. Um, so yeah, I knew it. Um, I didn't know to what degree, I guess, but I remember going home that summer and <clears throat> when, when he picked me up at the airport, he, he didn't even like say a word to me and that's very uncommon yeah. for, for him and that's uncommon for, for our relationship. You know, usually he'd pick me up, he'd have a couple of PBRs in the back seat. <laughs> you know, it was just like a couple of road sodas <laughs> for the way home and, we we would get talking and um it, it was always just like this uh jovial kind of like you know reunion right and it just wasn't that this time around he picked me up and it was just quiet it was eerily quiet it was weird and i just remember having that in the back of my mind when i left uh to come back to hawaii now living out here like six thousand miles away you get home rarely right you know like i i try to get back once a year because if that wasn't the case that there'd be some people in my life that are very important to me that i wouldn't see for 10 years right you know i don't know why they don't come out here but you know i'm not going to hold it against them um, i'll be there sometime anyway. soon I'll, I'll make a trip <laughs> soon i promise it, it's all me. good it's all good i tell people you know it costs the same either way right mm -hmm. and it's the same distance but yeah it's hawaii so uh, he dropped me off, and um, I just had a bad feeling about it. When he dropped you off? With you. Or when, when he you... dropped me off. Okay. When he dropped me off um, for the flight back to Hawaii, yeah, I, j I just didn't feel right about things. And um, I remember saying to uh, my girlfriend, Elena, I remember saying, There's something's not right. Something's not right about... Um, him and and the way that we we left things mm -hmm. you know it was it was kind of weird i remember he hugged me but as he hugged me he kind of like pushed me off of him mm -hmm. you know almost like 
I don't know how to explain it, but it was just like, I can't take, you know, knowing that you're so close and knowing that I'm in such a bad place. Um, so I get the phone call on November 9th and my stepmom called me and I was at work. I was teaching. It was, uh, middle of the day. It was a Friday and, um, yeah, she, she called, I missed her call. Um, I got this sinking feeling in my, my stomach. Uh, and then I got a text from her right afterwards that said, uh, call me now. And then I knew something wasn't right. And, um, I called her back. Um, and she said that, uh, your dad is gone. And I was just in utter shock. I couldn't believe it. Um, I just saying, no, 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 no. I just kept saying no. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what else to say. And then she told me how it happened. And then I was just even more just like floored, shocked. I didn't know what to do. Um, completely helpless, you know, so far away. Right. And, um, such heavy news and she said you know he he hung himself um and i just could not believe that it just uh it rocked my world um so i i um man it's hard just putting yourself back in that place i i yeah i can't even imagine but um I just remember, you know, walking through the halls of the school and passing by people that I pass by all the time mm -hmm. and just thinking to myself, this is hell. This is, you know, um, I, I didn't know how to, how to act, how to how to respond. I just, I just knew that I had to leave. So I went into my, um, uh, principal's office and he knew immediately something was wrong. And I told him what happened. Um, and I just broke down. I mean, I just lost it. Yeah. Um, I just started bawling and, uh, I'm thankful for him. He's a good guy and we have a great relationship and he just kind of held me. Um, and he was just in disbelief and in shock. And, you know, I just knew that I needed to, to leave. And um, I uh, called, called my mom, who lives out here now. And she, she works at an, like a little art gallery, maybe five minutes away from the school that I teach at. So I just told her to stay put. And I, had, I was going to come pick her up. And I had some bad news. Um, and I went and I picked her up and, um, and told her and, uh, you know, the, the initial feelings of it are just shock. You know, yeah. you, you don't have like a, a rational, uh, explanation or thought or anything like that. So I just, uh, I was just trying to stay standing upright, right. you know? Right. Um, but yeah, um, that, that day was, uh, you know, burned into my, my memory for forever. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember this past year actually, uh, it was the anniversary of, it was the anniversary of that day. So it wasn't any actual day, um, that he took his own life, but it was that it was Friday, uh, the eighth because the ninth was on a Saturday this year. But I just remember coming to school on that day and, um, man, the mind is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, I just got just really emotional and I thought I was going to keep it together. I thought I was going to be fine because relatively speaking, I've been, you know, 
been handling it all right. Yeah. And um, I've been able to, you know, I'm still going to work and I'm still carrying out the things that I need to do. You know, I finished that lacrosse season um, the year that he took his own life. And um, I just wasn't expecting it. But the way that trauma uh, affects the, the brain yeah. and the, the body altogether, I just remember being in my car in the parking lot and just kind of like frozen like I couldn't get out of the car Mm -hmm. um and then I just remember uh kind of pacing around the campus you know um not knowing what to do not knowing what to do yeah not knowing what to do it was so weird it was so weird did he leave a note uh or any that's a funny thing because <clears throat> um, there wasn't any suicide letter, mm-hmm. you know. I think he left lots of notes mm. throughout his whole life. Yeah. He he was a writer. He he composed, you know, music. He wrote his own songs. Um, he he was, you know, um, he was very just poetic in his in his being. Yeah. Uh, just the way that he spoke to people the way that he talked about life, the way that um, he he viewed things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he never left anything like explaining this is why. Um, but he left plenty of notes, I think, that just kind of highlighted some of his uh, uh, concern or... Um, discontent with the state of the world and just the way that you know things were going down and people were treating each other and you know he had such a big heart and he was kind of like an empath a very empathetic person so all this uh selfish nasty behavior just kind of it wasn't for him you know and I'm not saying that that kind of stuff pushed him over the edge but um I think that it definitely had an impact on his already crippling mental illness. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I always thought that that would be something I wanted. I always thought that maybe that would be... Um, what would be something you wanted? A note or like a uh, A note, an, an explanation. Yeah. You know, I think that's mm-hmm. a common thing for people like survivors of suicide is mm-hmm. you want some kind of explanation. But... Um, I had a great conversation with a close friend of mine who's also a Homer Homer guy, mm-hmm. and um, he also has some, you know, he struggles with his own mental health, and we had a conversation, uh, he came out here, we did like a paddle out memorial for my dad, and uh, spread his ashes down at this beach called Ho'okena, and he came out for that, and uh, he never knew my dad. He never met him, but he's, you know, a close friend of mine, and um, he knew what had happened, and because of his own situation, you know, he kind of said to me, I'll never forget seeing him on the couch, and he, he held up his his hand in a fist, and he was like the littlest, tiniest bit of light coming out of it on the other end, and he goes, when you're there, it's like you're holding a straw and that's all you can see is that little bit of light at the end and you don't get to see anything else in your peripheral vision you know you don't get to see all the people that love you you don't get to see the impact that you've made on all these other people you just see that little bit of hope and it 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 hurts you but it also keeps you going at the same time and you know um looking back on it you know it wasn't a choice I don't think that's a I don't think it's a conscious choice I think it's um it's an act of desperation for people that don't see any other way out that because that's how I felt 
Um, it, you know, by the grace of God, I got a phone call and that kind of stopped me in my tracks. And it took someone to tell me how much my parents loved me to kind of snap me out of it at that moment. Um, and it's not like, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe with your dad as well, and maybe you can shed some light on this. It's, it's not like <coughs> anything tragic or traumatic happened to him. It was all these little things kind of building and building and building and the light in that tube gets smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where there's just too much going on to, to want to handle it or want to deal with it or want to go on. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the, the, the fine details of my dad's upbringing or his family life, but he was Irish Catholic and, um, you know, my grandmother was an uh, immigrant from Sicily. Um, my grandfather worked in the construction br- uh, business and liked his scotch. And um, I think they were your typical kind of Catholic family uh, in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. And I think there was a lot of drinking that, yeah. that was going on. Um I don't really know what the relationship between my grandparents was like, but I think my dad by nature is a sensitive person. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, maybe he didn't grow up in the most, you know, sensitive, uh, household. Sure. Um, and I know that he had his own demons, you know, he had his, his own struggles with, with, um, with alcohol and, when you have depression and you add alcohol, it's like taking gasoline and putting it on a fire. So, uh, you know, he didn't really do anything to help himself in that state of mind that he was in. Right. Right. You know? Um, and yeah, I, you know, you don't need to have traumatic things or, or, uh, um, tragic stuff happen to you to to have any you know depression or anxiety or any kind of mental health issues but um I think he had some of that and I think his way to cope with it was through through alcohol and through other things um and there wasn't a whole lot of uh you know healthy outlets for him he wasn't a very like active person you know it was kind of like a chore to get him to go do anything physically active um but you know he had other positive outlets like playing music and stuff like that but he was not somebody that was going to go on a fucking run (laughs) (laughs) well i think it's interesting from generation to generation unless it was from the cops nah (laughs) yeah well Oh, so that's where you got it from. (laughs) Um, I think generationally, you know, I look at our, so my great, great grandfather um, killed himself and my grandfather found him. And I think every generation becomes a little bit more open and a little bit more willing to talk about the things that they're going through. And that's why I'm really excited for our generation to start to bring this really to the forefront Um, because now we're seeing our own parents as they get older, deal with it and, and, and struggle with it. And, you know, he was 60, how old, Dan? 64. 64. Okay. 64. 64 years of, of never having an outlet or never being encouraged to talk about your emotions, especially as a male, you know, Mm -hmm. especially as someone growing up in that sort of culture and, um, just turning to alcohol to kind of cover it up and like make things happy or to forget things for that matter. Um, yeah. And you and I can talk more about this as well. It's like, that's kind of what your coping mechanisms are um, instead of talking about the emotions behind it. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, uh, that's a really great thing. That's, you know, that's evolution and it, that's when it's, you know, um, that's a win for everybody. If we are, um, 
if we're learning from the past right. and we're trying to be better and get better, that's right. a good thing. Yeah. Right. You yeah. don't want to repeat the past. You don't want to repeat, um, history. And, uh, my dad had outlets, you know, he had people to talk to. He had a great group of friends that, you know, were, they were family to, they are family to me. And, um, you know, he had, he had people that were close to him that he could kind of open up to, but there, it, there's a difference when you're like clinically depressed. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between talking to your good friend right. and talking to somebody that's a professional right. and somebody that actually knows what's going on and how to treat it and how to, um, you know, continue treatment. Um, that's something that, that he lacked. And it's something I see now, you know, you'd be ashamed to say you had a therapist 20 years ago. Right. It's it's kind of like, it's like a talking point at dinner for people that yeah. are millennials, millennials. Yeah. I don't know what the hell you call us anymore, but, uh, you know, it's like, oh, this is what my therapist, therapist told me, or this is what I, you know, right. who do you go see? It's almost or, like a status oh, symbol it's, now. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah. if you're not going to therapy, you're, you're, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's a happy middle ground. 100%. You know, yeah. I, I don't necessarily want to be a part of that that dinner conversation with you know everybody in therapy. But at the same time, I don't want to be sitting around a table full of people that just stuff their emotions deep down and don't talk about shit. Right. Right. You know. Um, so just- because the bottom line is we're all going through it. We're all going through something. I started this is because you know you and I have talked several times over the last year like I said and um we're like Meg you, you've got to tell people how you got from like the bottom to now where you are today and and yeah seeing psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists and medication all of that is absolutely necessary um if it is necessary for you you know some people are not on medications and that's fine but I think hearing other people's stories, talking to other people that have been through it or are very much going through it now is just as important, if not more important than seeing doctors and seeing therapists and being on medication because it just gives you that that validation that you're not fucking crazy and that you're, you're not alone and that there are other people struggling and that's what I feel like that's what I needed when I was 17, 18, 19, 20, 25 years old. Like if I had someone else to talk to about it and just commiserate with almost and someone to be like, it's okay that you're feeling like this. It's okay that you feel crazy. Here are the steps. Here's what we can do together in combination with your therapist, in combination with the medication and all of that, that would have helped. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Sergio Simpson has like one of my favorite lines in a song. Uh, it goes something like, uh, I'm sorry if I act a little crazy, but goddamn, sometimes crazy is just how I feel. Right. And, you know, that's that's real talk. Right. That's just, um, you know, when you <clears throat> when you normalize it a little bit, then you make people a little bit uh more vulnerable and open to having the conversation and saying something like that. Like, you know what? I'm struggling or I, you know, my mind is, is, uh, is going crazy right now. And and I don't know what to do. You know, I need some help. Right. Um, and I remember when you were going through that and just seeing the growth, uh, in you as as a friend and as somebody that's that's close to you and knowing back then that it was something that was out of your control yeah it was it was it was not like you were in the driver's seat you know somebody else was driving the car yeah and and you were trying to gain control over it and you couldn't and it makes you from the outside looking in you know it's like you feel helpless. You you feel sad because you you want to help that person, but you can't. Right. You know you can't 
because then you're driving the car, right. you know? Right. And that's not helping. You got to put that person back in the driver's seat. Right. Right. And and for me, I didn't I didn't, you know, we were 19, 21, 22 right around there and when <laughs> when we dated and um it was great when it was great and it was toxic and awful when it was <laughs> when it was toxic and awful and we definitely both contributed to it and um I think me obviously a little bit more so and I appreciate you saying making that analogy because I've never heard you say that to me and that like still to this day even even though I feel like I can say I'm recovered and I feel you know completely opposite of how I felt seven 16 years ago um to hear you say that just it just kind of takes this weight off my shoulders because that's how I felt so to have someone right. else act- actually acknowledge that I'm like okay like all these years, like looking back, like it, it wasn't my fault. But I also want to point out that I didn't do a lot to take control during those mm. years because I didn't know what to do. I mean, this right. is in college when it's the biggest drinking years of your life. And I was on, you name it, I've been on every medication you can think of, Prozac, Lamictal, Effexor, Wellbutrin, everything. And, um, all those years of college, you know, I was on medication and I don't know how much I, I think I did block some of this out. I don't know how much I disclosed to you or played the victim to you. Um, but I remember recently when we had this discussion to put this on this platform and and do this episode, you kind of made the point like, you know, Meg, you were, you were drinking and you were drinking heavily. And that was probably, the last thing you should have been doing, but it's like, I was in college. I was, that's the way you socialize. So how was I supposed to give that up? And like, then I'd be even more depressed sitting in my dorm room alone. Like, okay, I'm just going to go out and try to control it. And I would drink in excess. And uh, I mean, I lost my shit. I would do things that are very unlike me. Um, so what was it like? from the outside and knowing that I was going through something, but not really understanding like what depression really was or what anxiety was at that point. Um, what was it like having someone like that in your life and, and being so close to someone? At the time I didn't understand it. Cause I, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't struggling with anything like that, but right. then, you know, that would come back and bite me in the ass <laughs> real, real hard. Um, but at the time I didn't really, I didn't know. Um, I just knew that, uh, like you said, you know, some of the behavior and stuff, it just wasn't like, uh, normal, yeah. you know, yeah. I hate to use the word normal, but, uh, it was uncharacteristic for, for who you were. And, right. you know, I felt like I knew you pretty well. Right. So right. when I saw you flying off the handle or, you know, um, things would get out of hand. I'd be like, what the hell is going on? Right. You know? Um, and I think that it can be a real, um, chemical mess when you start mixing that shit, when you start mixing that medication with alcohol, with drugs, it's just like you're, you're creating a Molotov cocktail you know, and you got the lighter and you're just yeah. like you, the lighter is lit. You're just waiting to hold it to that cocktail and then let it go. Right. And, right. um, who knows what it, what it takes for somebody to get to that point. But, um, you know, I'm just glad that you came out on the other end of it. Um, you know, cause I was really worried about you at, at certain stages of our relationship. Um, and I felt, I felt helpless. Yeah. And I didn't know if there was anything that I could do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I was 23 or 20, 23, 22, somewhere around there. I had my first panic attack and that shit scared me straight. Like nothing else in my life. It just shook me down to my core. Like, 
Nothing has ever scared me more in my life than having something like that happen out of nowhere. I think well, you were I say 24. Nowhere, but... I think you were 24 because it was like a year after like I had moved and I remember you called me and you were like, I think something just happened to me. I think I just had a panic attack. I think something just went down. And... Well, yeah, I was sitting at the table. I was. It was Thanksgiving. I was sitting at the table. I was playing cards with my cousin. And all of a sudden, just the room got like super small, and I could hear I could hear my heartbeat like in every part of my body, mm-hmm. it, and it felt like it was gonna jump straight out of my chest. And I remember standing up, and um, I just left the card game, and I just walked into the other room. <laughs> I walked into the other room, and all the all the aunties and the cousins and they were listening to Audio Slave or some shit. I don't know. They were listening to like some hardcore music, like rocking out. Like, what the fuck is going on in here? And I just remember being like, "Oh, I got to get out of this room," because that was even worse. And I looked at my dad and I said, "I think I'm having a heart attack." He's like, "You're not having a heart attack." I'm like, "No, I'm serious. Like, I think I'm gonna die." He's like, "You're not gonna die." And his his uh his approach was like, here, have some whiskey, right? (laughs) You know, like calm, calm down. And I'm like, no, really? Like you gotta. And then when he saw that I was being serious, he was like, all right, let's get in the car. You know, I'll take you to the emergency room, Mm -hmm. you little baby, Mm -hmm. you know, come on. So, uh, we went to the, to the ER and they hooked me up to all the machines and stuff. And that's when they said, you know, you had a panic attack. And I was like, what? Right. I was like, I wasn't panicked about anything. I was playing cards. Like I was, I was completely fine. I was at home. I was with my family. It was the holidays, you know? Um, but then I, you know, I realized that I was stuffing all this, this stuff down, right? not dealing with it. And then it just bubbles up. Mm-hmm. And that was just kind of the, the catalyst to what would end up being like, a long run at dealing with that shit. Right, I right. mean, for a solid year and a half. And no offense to your dad, because that's what he knew and that's how he was raised and that's how what he experienced. But it's very much that old mentality, especially with men, that it's like, sure. okay, man up, don't be a baby. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. It's like, sometimes you just need someone to look at you and be like, you're not fine. And this is fucked up. And that does suck, you know? Um, or like, this is scary. Yeah, this um, is scary. Like, you know. validate my feelings right now. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So when we talked, you were, I remember, I literally remember you saying like, Meg, I finally get it. I finally know what it's like to be, to have like an out of body experience, like where you are not in control of your own breath, of your own mind, of your own heartbeat, of your own anything. Um, even it's... though it was a different capacity than like depression and bipolar, it's still that, that disconnect between your, your brain and your body, you know? Right. Um, so what are the things that helped you kind of work through your anxiety over the, that year and a half? <clears throat> that was one of probably the most humbling experiences outside of moving 6,000 miles away and living on an Island. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. And, um, I, man, thinking back on it, you know, I, I would have them every day. Mm. I would have panic attacks at the thought of having a panic right. attack. Right. <clears throat> you know, it's like you're anticipating when the next one's going to happen. So you're just triggering right. the next one to happen. It's so, so fucked up, Yeah. you know, but, um, I did not want to take medication for it I was I was pretty firm on that mm-hmm. and that was just my own personal beliefs that's not that I'm I'm not saying that you know it doesn't work for people or that it's not right for people but back then um, I went and I saw my my you know uh, physician family doctor and he wanted to prescribe me uh, Paxil or something, which was like an antidepressant slash anti-anxiety, mm-hmm. but I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. I just remember taking it home, um, opening it or, or looking at it um, and reading the, you know, the side effects on the, the script that they give you and, and you know, 
just all this list of side effects, you know, possible suicidal tendencies. And I was thinking to myself, why would I ever take, I don't want to take something that's going to make me possibly right. think I want to kill myself. Right. Why would I do that? So <clears throat> I, um, I did a bunch of different things. Um, I did some, uh, I went to a, a homeopathic doctor got some like, you know, snake oil type stuff that didn't really work. Mm -hmm. Um, I tried like, um, being hypnotized. Really? That, yep. I did that with some, some guy in Ithaca (laughs) 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 for anybody that's listening. For for those that know Ithaca, that makes a lot of (laughs) sense. You know that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, needless to say, I was not hypnotized out of having panic attacks. Um, but you know, uh, it, eventually I just, I kind of took a look a little bit closer at the things that I was not confronting or dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, I had failed out a semester at college. I was partying way too much. Mm-hmm. I was not taking things seriously. Um, you know, I was acting like an asshole in a lot of, a lot of aspects of my life. Right. And, um, I, I just, you know, try to address that with being a little bit more disciplined, um, exercising and, you know, <clears throat> staying away from stimulants and stuff like that. And eventually right. I just kind of was able to curb it. Yeah. You know, I haven't had one in a long time. Um, but, uh, I was dating somebody at the time and I remember just, you know, now feeling probably how you were feeling yeah. when we were dating. And it's like, I didn't want to go out to parties. I didn't want to be in certain social situations. And by all respects, I'm a pretty social person. Mm-hmm. And when you meet somebody and they are that, you know, that social person, and then they kind of um, don't want to be involved in those activities. You're like, well, what's, you know, what's going on? Right. And it was hard to explain and I couldn't explain it. And she was really understanding, but I could tell she was frustrated. Mm-hmm. I could tell that it was, it was affecting her life and her happiness and her well being. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's ironic how some of these things just come full circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But sometimes they need to. Sometimes they need to so that you can kind of, you know, that's how you that's how you grow or learn or become a better person. Right, right. Um, so I kind of want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about what you're seeing at the high school level. Um, mm. You know, especially with the ninth and 10th graders and – You know, back in that day, like, thank God there was not social media. Thank God there was not Instagram and you could see how many likes somebody had. And uh, I mean, I think that would have just added to all of our stressors growing up. Um, Yeah. And especially with with the the boys that you're seeing in school, like, what are you seeing day in and day out with their with their habits and their behaviors and their emotional state? Oh, it's mm, I feel bad. Because it's, it's not good, especially the boys. Um, I think we have such a a long way to go when it comes to teaching young men about their emotions and about um, how they're feeling and how to express their feelings in ways that are encouraged and appropriate. Right. Uh, because a lot of what I see is just the opposite of that. You know, it's kids acting out because they don't have that um, opportunity or they don't have that outlet. And uh, this is just my opinion and just from my experience working at a high school, you know, co-ed, boys and girls, uh, I feel like, I don't know if, you know, I can say as a society, but I know that in in the school systems, or at least in our school, I definitely see people, teachers, adults, catering more towards the girls Mm -hmm. and their emotional needs more than the boys. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because 
Uh, it's it's not that that anybody's wrong for doing that, right? You know, I'm not saying that somebody deserves it more than the other, right. but when you see it outwardly, when you see somebody crying or you see somebody visibly upset, you're going to go to that person right. before you go to the kid that just threw a fucking chair across the room, right? Or you know, is is just like. Uh, disengaged in class or has his head down right you know those kids i think that's the i I think that's the natural response but it doesn't mean that that kid or that boy usually that boy is not going through something as you know equally as hard or harder than what that girl is going through right right and that kid needs an outlet and he needs somebody to talk to and he needs to be able to cry you know if i ever have a moment and i have and I have had this oppor- you know, this experience with, with young men where they've cried in front of me. And one of the first things I say to them before anything else is, it's okay to cry. Yeah. Like, you can do that, and I'm not judging you at all. Like, it's okay to cry. Mm-hmm. And you kind of see their shoulders just, like, drop a little bit, right. you know, and they're, they just kind of... Um, they relax a little bit more. They're not so clenched up. They're not so in fear of like being that vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, Jesus Christ, these kids are going through so much uh, pressure, social pressure to uh, be this you know perfect version of themselves or present this perfect version. Right. It's not just them. I mean, I see people our age doing that right. shit. Right. And it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense because it's unattainable. Right. Um, it, it, you, can't, you can't be that. And we want that validation. I think a lot of people are just surf, searching for that validation. Mm-hmm. So um, you get it, but it's, it's temporary and it's not real. And um, – we have a lot of kids that, you know, they have anxiety. Mm-hmm. Like if you take a phone away from like I took a phone away from a student uh, just the other day and she could not sit still. She she had to like get up and walk away, go to the bathroom or, you know, because she did not have that device and it was giving her anxiety not having it. Right. You know, Um there's like this uh yeah it's like a everybody needs to go through like a technological detox right and i'm i'm guilty of it too i'm no better i i've become more attached to this thing than i would ever want to be but i realize that it causes me unnecessary anxiety you know i i've i've kind of made that connection but you still are making the choice to use it you know yeah. Um, you're still making the choice to to use some of these platforms. And I think some people use it for the right way. And a lot of us kind of use it as a um, as a cop out mm-hmm. to deal with, you know, uh, we're not really addressing our anxiety or our real issues. We're saying, oh, yeah, I only use it to keep in touch with family or friends. You know, it's like you're not using it at all for your own validation. It doesn't feel good when somebody likes a a picture of, you know, yourself right. on a beach or right. whatever. You know, it's of, – of course people do. I think that's natural. I think that's just human nature. Right, right. To, to, to seek out that validation. Well, and I think our kids are, you know, they're so incredibly observant from the time that they're toddlers and, and – babies and toddlers and children, like they see the way that their parents act and deal with circumstances and deal with emotion and deal with their relationships. And that becomes what, what they're taught. I mean, they're not, yeah, they're learning a lot of this in school as well, but, um, it starts with, with the parents and the adults that they're directly involved with every single day. And, you know, I, as a swim teacher for the past, you know, 20 years almost, I have been, been around kids for a very long time. And I guess, you know, you can only tell parents what they don't want to hear, right? You can only say so much to parents, but we have an opportunity, you as a, as a, you know, a teacher and me as someone involved in fitness and 
and with kids teaching them swimming, like at least I can be an example for them during that hour a day, right? So you being at school and, and being around these kids and be like, listen, dude, it's okay to cry. Like I'll cry with you. I'll like talk you through this and, and let's <clears throat> talk about these emotions. Like I think if everyone kind of takes responsibility for their part in society and how it's, it's reflected into the next generation, like that's kind of the first step. Um, is leading by example and, and also really talking about it. And, and like I had a, a guest on last week or it will be two weeks ago. Um, and he was talking about his kids. He's got three kids and he's like, I've never connected with my kids more than when I was telling him about my breakup and I was completely vulnerable and crying. And he was like, it was that moment that we connected more than any other time in their lives. And I'm like, so it's so true and it's so pointed and it's so necessary. Um, but it's terrifying for us to do as adults in front of other adults, much less in front of kids. But I think that's the human emotion. That's the connection that we all have at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, I mean, let me ask you, when was the, when was your first time you felt like true, true love, you know, or at least you felt like you, you felt true love. Like self-love or from someone else? From, no, I mean, like you felt like you were in love with somebody when, you know, you were dating somebody. That was, Uh, come on. I already know the answer. (laughs) It was high school. Right? It was high school. It was high school. It was high school. It was, it was, That's your first love. You yeah. know, you really feel stuff in high school. Yeah. You really feel a lot. Like kids at that age right. feel so much. Right, right. They yeah. feel so much. A lot of it is just bullshit, but they still feel it. Like they still feel right. everything, um, you know, deeply. Right. Deeply. And then what happens for me if we're gonna if we're gonna go there, once that love is taken away, it's like, what am I left with? What validates me as a human being if I don't have that? So right. you know, teaching our kids that they are so complete from a very young age and they don't necessarily you know need a boyfriend or girlfriend at 12, 13, 14, 15 years old to complete them is it, is it gonna change anything? Or are they still gonna want it? Sure. But if we can give right. them that extra confidence going into these hard things that they're going to experience as teenagers, maybe, you know, it will help them get through the situations. Because let's face it, like, especially at 15 years old, you think you're in love and, um, you know, you throw that word around because that's what we do. Um, chances are that's not going to be the person you're going to marry. Right. So. You have two yeah, options. Sometimes when, it is. Sometimes, you know. very rarely. But chances are most 15-year-olds are not going to end up, right. you know, with... With somebody with, named Grundle. Oh, my God. Please don't <laughs> go there. You're such an asshole. <laughs> you know what? He's actually doing very well for himself. So I, I need to That's give him That's awesome. But at the end of the day, awesome. I was so incomplete. My swimming career was going downhill. I was a giant. I was huge. I was... 15 years old with no self-confidence, even though I had everything in the world that a 15 year old could want. And it was just kind of that tipping point of him breaking up with me that I lost it. And that was at 16. And, um, you know, in hindsight, it's, it's like ridiculous now to look back and be like, well, that's what almost ended my life. But I mean, it is what it is. And, um, but I also think there's a genetic component to people with mental illness and that it's always there. It's always at the surface and something triggers them. So for me, sure. that was kind of the trigger and it was going to happen one way or another. Um, and I guess I'm grateful that it happened in high school when I was still under my parents' roof, even though I hated them and ran away and um, did all of those things. If it had happened in college, I don't know if I would have stopped with that knife, you know, Um So for me, looking back, I just wish there was a way that we could help teach our kids how how important they are and how much they matter and how valid their emotions are before it gets to that point.
I think that um, I think that you're you're absolutely right, and I think that our kids also need a, a huge dose of um, empathy or lessons on empathy, right. and I th- I think that's uh, that's something that's that's missing um, certainly in the schools. It's a tough thing to to teach, right. but you know, it's, there's a huge difference between empathy and sympathy. Right. And I don't want anybody's sympathy, right. you know, I, and I don't know a lot of people out there that do. And I think people that, that sympathize, they're just, they're, it's a natural thing to do. Mm-hmm. You, you want to try and like fix that person or put the silver lining around a real shitty situation, mm-hmm. but it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually help. Right. Um, actually, we're we're doing a lot of work in our school um, around social emotional learning and trauma informed practices mm-hmm. and um, educating teachers about you know the the differences between empathy and sympathy right. and how a lot of these kids are coming to school with so much baggage and so much trauma and and how do you get them to a point where they're learning ready you right. know where they can right. actually learn yeah. and you know there's a um i think she's an educator her name is Brene Brown she's also an yeah. author mm-hmm. and she does you know some TED talks and things mm-hmm. like that and she has a an example of you know uh empathy is you know you're you're in a you're down in a deep in a in a dark hole and uh somebody from above sees you down in that dark hole and then they climb down the ladder and they stand in that hole with you and say man i know it sucks down here i've been down here yeah. you know and i'm sorry like um and sometimes you can't empathize with what the person is going through but you can say something <laughs> along the lines of you know i don't know what that's like but I appreciate you telling me that. Right. And that sounds like it's really challenging. Right. You know, right. sympathy looks like you're looking at the top, you know, looking down and you're saying, ooh, it's pretty dark down there. Yeah. You know, M- um, must be tough. You know, like you want a sandwich? Right. I think that's kind of like the skit that she has on her um, her little tutorial or, or whatever video about empathy and sympathy. and Yeah. Kids need that, you know. Kids, right, kids right. need to be empathetic with one another. Yeah, and it's hard when you don't have that. Um, so much of their interactions are through through phones, right. you know. Right. Social media and all of that for validation. I guess for me, I equate it to you know how can you, you know how can you teach? Like, let's take you for an example. How are you going to coach a lacrosse team if you don't know how to play lacrosse? How Mm -hmm. are we as adults going to help these kids if we're not looking in the mirror and dealing with it ourselves? Right. Right. So um, it needs to start there. We've got to take care of ourselves as adults first and understand what we're going through and being really brutally honest and take responsibility for what we're going through in order to help our next generation. Um, because we can't help them unless we understand. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. This is this has been amazing. I really appreciate you just being completely open and honest and and transparent and um you know, I I give you a lot of credit. It's only been a year. This is very fresh and very new and I know you're still very much going through a lot of um the emotions that happen after losing someone, especially suddenly and unexpectedly. So, um, thank you for doing this. And yeah, I appreciate you giving me the, um, the opportunity to talk about it. I feel like yeah. things like this are all part of the, the healing process. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, I, somebody said to me, you know, you don't ever get over it. You just get through it. Right. And I guess I'm just kind of, acquainting myself with this new version of me you know because I'm never going to be the person that I was prior to this happening so I'm just trying to learn from it become better and uh and grow from it and like you said you know use it as uh as something to help the the next generation or you know your neighbor somebody 
close by, right. you know. Right. And I know, I, I mean, you know this, but I know your dad would be so incredibly proud that, um, that you are sharing your story and that you're talking about it and you're real and you're honest because that's what he was always his whole life. He was authentic and he was a real genuine human being. So I know he would, he would say, um, you're doing the right <clears throat> thing and, and, uh, he would be so proud of you. I know he's proud of you. If, uh, if I was to guess, my dad would want me to live a happy and full life. And I know that. And um, that's going to choke me up saying that. And I made it through this whole thing without <laughs> crying. So don't do it now. <laughs> don't do it now. You know what? It's not the worst it's thing okay to cry. It's okay to cry. It is okay to cry. Like, <laughs> See, you did it. You didn't do it, man. That's the problem. I'm telling it's you. It's been like three no, weeks in I'm a row. Kidding. Like, no, cry it out. Like, sometimes it's really good to just have a good cry, you know, and just get it yeah, out. And, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, I know that he wouldn't want me to stop living my life right. or um, just kind of wallow in in self-pity or um anger or you know you feel those emotions like you you can have them you can right you know have them and let them let them course through your veins and then and then get them out and then move right. forward right. and live your life take that time feel that but don't let it live there yeah don't let it live there yeah like it can hold space there but don't let it live there Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Six Feet Above. I'm your host, Megan Armstrong. Subscribe so you never miss another episode. And if you're enjoying the series, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram at Six Feet Above Podcast to keep the conversation going. This episode is a product of Audiographies, produced by Denor Sapolia edited by Jacob Smullyan, and the music was by Keenan Willis. I'll see you next time.